Okay, why are you four standing? Why are you four standing? Four standing? Get a seat. How many of you were at the uh, veterans uh, breakfast when I talked? Everybody was there? Okay, good. So you remember remember the story I told about the pilot and all that. Okay. <coughs> My name is uh, Mr. Newberger, but you can call me Mr. Newberger, okay? And Reeswine. Um, I'd like to start off by giving everybody a little bit of background on myself. I was born in 1949. How many of you were here in 1949? Uh, yeah. How many of your parents were here in 1949? 1949, your parent was here? How old's your dad? Uh, 34. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you? Yeah. Who? My dad and mom. How old are they? How long? 48. No. 48. They're 40. So subtract 48 from 2018. And what do you have? Come on, who's the math wizards here? Yeah, probably about the 70s, right? Yeah. And, uh, maybe you have grandparents that are my age, 69, probably. Right? So I went to a. I went to. Um, I went to You want to get up and talk, young lady? You want to get up and talk? You're welcome to. Okay. Um, I went to a elementary school, a public elementary school. I was a terrible student. Terrible. I failed everything. Math, English, history. The only thing I was good in was was singing and believing. That was no easy thing either. So. It ended up back then, they didn't know what ADD was. I had ADD, attention deficit disorder. Um, I can't even say it right, can I? Attention deficit disorder, yeah, so it's never. Um, back then, they didn't know what that was. So if, if you, were, you were always, you know, the teachers would always say, oh, all he does all day long is daydream. Not really, and I did, I daydream because I couldn't, I couldn't read. I couldn't pick up a book and read because, and even to this day, I hardly read anything because I don't have the attention. I'll start reading something in a paper or in a book, and I'll maybe get through the first paragraph, and then I'm flipping pages, or I'm off somewhere else because of that. Um, so by the time I finally graduated from grammar school, I knew there was no way I could um, go to a normal high school where you had to learn algebra and, and geometry and all that. So fortunately for me, in my city, we had three high schools. We had East Side, we had Central, and we had an all boys school that was a, it was called Patterson Vocational and Technical High School. And that's where you went to learn a trade, whether it was carpentry or plumbing or machine shop or auto shop. That's where all the boys went, the boys that knew they weren't going to make it through a regular high school. And you had to take an exam to get in. You had to take a, I, I forget how many page exam it was, but it was all common sense things like, things like if, if one wheel is turning, if one wheel is turning this way, if that thing falls off, you've got to pick it up. If you have a gear that is turning this way, and you have a gear here, and then you have another gear, which way are these two gears going to turn? And you had to figure that out. So if this one's going this way, this one's going to go this way, and this one's going to go this way. So you had those kind of questions. Another, another question that stuck out in my mind is, which is heavier? Now pay attention, which is heavier? A ton of wheat or a ton of steel? Trick question. They're the same. But you'd be surprised how many people don't, they're thinking, well, it's going to take, they're thinking which is more. But the question is, which ways, you know, do they weigh the same? So those were the kind of questions you had to answer um, to get into that high school. So fortunately, I did get in. Um, and then the first year of your high school there, you had to take six weeks of each shop. So you went to carpentry and plumbing and electric and yada, 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 yada. And at the end of your freshman year, you had to pick three shops. Your first pick, second pick, third pick. My first pick was aircraft. I wanted to be an aircraft mechanic. I wanted to work on helicopters. My second pick was electric. 
find my third pick. I honestly, I think it might have been refrigeration. I'm not, I don't even remember. But unfortunately for me, I was the only one that hit the aircraft shop, and so they shut it down. And so I ended up being an industrial electrician, which my father was and his uncles were. So that's where I became an electrician. So at, in, my, in my senior year, and I think I might have told part of this story I think the last time. One of the boys, just after September, when we went back to school, he turned 18 and he quit. And he went and joined the Marine Corps. And he was at boot camp until sometime in December. And he graduated and he came home. And he came to school to see the teacher in the class and talk to them. And when he walked in the classroom, he was wearing his dress blues. And when I seen him in them dress blues, I said, that's what I want to do. And so I went right after school, I went to the recruiter. The recruiter told me to come back in April, which I did. I signed up on what they had then was called a 120 day program. From the day you signed, you had 120 days to finish high school. And then you left for boot camp. So I graduated high school around the 25th of June. 12 days later, I was in Paris Island, South Carolina at boot camp. And I thought, what did I get myself into? All because I liked that uniform. That was the dumbest reason to join the Marine Corps that anyone could have ever had. So some, some, sometimes you need to think, think things through before you do them. Would I do it again? Yes, I would. But at the time, at the time was, it was 1967. It was right in the middle of the Vietnam War. But back then, you know, who paid it, who, what kids paid attention to the news? Now, how many of you here sit and watch the news at me? A few, yeah. Once in a while. Yeah, once in a while. Because it, it, it really doesn't matter to you. I mean, there's nothing on there that, you, that really concerns you. Um, so that was the case with me. I never paid attention to it. My dad watched it because he was in the war. And uh, he was in World War II. My grandfather was in World War I. Um, and so I, it was natural for me to join. Um, so I did. I graduated August 31st of 1967. I came home for a few days. I flew to uh, Pennsylvania. I flew to uh, California to uh, the Marine Corps base out there, Camp Pendleton, and I went to school to be a radio operator. There's a radio right there on that table. That yep. Yeah. So. I went to be, I, I became a radio operator, and the, the, the number for, everybody gets a number, you know. You get a serial number when you join the service. Mine was 235530, and never forget it. What's yours? 4699. You don't forget, you, you never forget it. Never forget it. But everything else, in the, you know, the government has a number for everything. They have, everything here has a number. What your classification is, is a number. I was a 2531 radio operator. 11 Charlie. Which is what? Mortar. Mortar. Um, 03, uh, 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 2511 was a guy who climbed telephone poles and ran telephone lines. 0311, that's the one you didn't want because that meant you were a grunt. You were the guy that was gonna go out and do the shooting. You were the guy that was gonna go out and do the killing. And that's just what your job was kill somebody before they kill you. That's what the Marines job is. They don't train you to be a radio operator. You're first a fighter. When the, when the stuff hits the fan, you put your radio down, you grab your rifle, and you do what you have to do. So every Marine is actually an 0311, basically, but they train others to be radio operators, or telephone pole climbers, or whatever you might have, mortar men. Artillery. Here's an artillery. This is an artillery battalion right here. I know it's hard to see. I'll pass it around in a little while. It's, these are big howitzers. These are 105 howitzers. That's the group I was with. I was with an artillery battalion attached to um, uh, a, grunt a grunt battalion, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So I graduated in August. I went to the school. I, from the school, they put us on a Pan Am airplane and they flew us to Okinawa which was a staging place for Vietnam. That's where you went as a Marine, getting ready to go to Vietnam. That's where they issued you these kind of uniforms. Um, our regular 
uniforms were just like a pair of dungarees, but of course green. Um, these here have the big cargo pockets. They have the cargo pockets on your shirt. Um, and the boots that you wore, and it's going to be hard to see, but the boots are specially designed. If you can see, they have a fabric here, a leather on the bottom, a fabric here, and in the bottom, they have steel plate. Um, and, the, and the reason for these is because you were in a climate that was constantly wet. The whole, the whole flatland of Vietnam is nothing but rice paddies, and if, uh, if we pass around the book and some of the pictures that I have, you can see what the landscape looks like and, and some of the other things. So they issued the clothing there, then you got on a plane and you went to Vietnam. I landed in Vietnam on December 23rd. Merry Christmas. I stayed there for two years. Why, I don't know. I extended. What is this? The normal tour for Vietnam was 13 months and then they sent you home. Unless you got wounded badly and you went home right away. But you could extend your time there if you wanted to in increments of six months. So I extended for six months. And then I was going to extend again, and they said, well, if you want to extend again, you have to go see the psychiatrist. Because we want to know why you want to stay. You know, some people just didn't want to go home. Others, like me, they said, nah, you need to go home. So I went home. So Vietnam was, and, and to this day, most of it is still like a third world country. People live in huts, grass huts, no windows. No doors, no floor other than just the third floor. They have no bathrooms. They have no running water. They don't have things like toilet paper. They don't have, they, they have makeshift types of pots and pans that they use to cook. Their main meals are rice, obviously, because they're growing nothing but rice. Fish, and sometimes dogs if they can catch them. Because that, that was their meat. They, you know, water bowl. They would slaughter a water bowl, or if a water bowl died. A water bowl is a big animal that has big horns on it, and they use them to plow their um, rice paddies. So you, you would see you know, a rice paddy would, could be as big as this room, maybe a little bit wider, and they all have little dikes around them that you could walk on to not be in the water. Um, if they had to go to the bathroom, they would just squat down right where they were and do what they had to do. Water bowl would do the same thing, right in, right in there where the rice was growing. Um, what they used to wipe themselves with, I don't know, was a leaf or something, whatever they had handy, I guess. They all wore black pajamas, well, I call them pajamas, black silk pants, a black silk shirt that had a v-neck. They wore a straw hat that sort of came to a point with a brim around it because during the day in Vietnam, during the summertime, it was 110, 120, 125 degrees. But it was a comfortable heat because there was no humidity. You didn't sweat to death. It was warm. Most of us just walked around with our utility pants and a t-shirt um, because of the weather. And it was really beautiful. Then monsoon season would come. Six months of steady rain. It would rain and rain and rain and rain and rain. It would rain so much, you get a little break here and there, but it would rain so much that if you were walking over to the mess hall and you were walking under, the, you know, our compound had full third roads, you could sink, if you stepped in the wrong spot, you could sink up to your waist in the mud and they'd have to pull you out with a jeep. We had tanks, everybody knows how big a tank is, we had tanks that would sink in the mud up to the terrain, and they would have to bring in tank retrievers to pull it out. It, it was just, the, the, the rain was oh, amazing, how, how much it rained. Oh. So, on that, on that particular fire base we had, we had an airstrip. The fire base was called ANHOA, A-N-H-O-A, ANHOA, or H-O-E, I'm sorry. We had a, we had a, we had a, a landing strip. We had a radio relay platoon over on the far side of the of the, of the strip. Um, 
up. So our, our base was our base was sort of uh, came down and around in this way. And the entrance to the base was right about here, and the airstrip was over here. And I'll never forget the mess halls right there. That's where you went to eat. Our our gun battalion was over here on this side. Back over here were two track mounted like a tank, but they were 108 millimeters. And then next to them, over here, were two 175 millimeter cannons. They were huge, huge. Um, and the, and then the, we had other things over here, a hospital and you know barber shop and a, and a, and a commissary. Um, you know where you could go and buy cigarettes or stuff like that. You know toothpaste and toothbrushes. Um, so when we were back here on the base, um, over here, over here, this, on this side here was where the, uh, this was 2nd Battalion, 11th Marines, and this was 2nd Battalion, 5th Marine. Now the 5th Marines were the grunts. They were the guys that went out and did the ground pounding. I was assigned to them. My job, my job was to clear any fire missions that were called in from the guys out in the field. So what would happen, we would, the, the, uh, the, the, the gun battalion would send out lieutenants to each of the four companies. They were called the forward observers. They each had a radio man from our, from our gun company with them. And they carried a radio like that there on the table. And, and the lieutenant would call in a fire mission. The radio operator would call it into the, to the gun company who would then start the plot how they were going to raise the cannon, the guns, and fire which way, and all that stuff. In the meantime, my job was to check with the battalion to make sure we had no friendlies in the zone where he was calling in the fire mission. And then on my other radio, because I carried two radios, I had to call down to Da Nang, where I had to get clearance from the air corps, from the jets, from the from the uh, tower down there, so that we wouldn't shoot down any of our own planes or helicopters. So that was my job. Once I got those clearances, I gave it to the gun company and they could go ahead and shoot. Now these guns here, they probably would shoot about, I don't know, eight or nine miles, I guess, maybe even more than that. What do you think? Are those 155s? Oh, no, there are either 105s or 155s. I, I, it's, hard for me, it's hard for me to tell without putting my glasses on. But yeah, they, one, they one, 155s will reach out probably 13 miles. Yeah, you get a good distance on them. They shoot quite a distance. So 13 miles from here, what, maybe down to uh, Swan. Swan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you Swan. can shoot from here and Georgia. Hit Swan. You can shoot from here and hit Highgate. To give you an idea um, how much technology has changed since then, we have the 155s now have what they call wrap rounds, rocket assist projectiles. You can shoot. Burlington from here with the new with that those new rounds. Yeah, your question. How long would it take to reach like 13 miles? Not very long. Maybe a minute, maybe a minute and a half. You know, that they, they you could you could they would give you a sh I mean if I asked them if I if I said, you know, give me a shot, they would give me they'll say you uh, know round fired and then I would relay it to the other end said rounds fired and then they would wait for it. I got I used to get a lot of calls from uh, our recon people you know, one or, uh, one or two team man, men that would go out by themselves and try to infiltrate the NVA or the VC. And you know, they would be sneaking around with all kinds of stuff on their face and bushes on them and all that. And they would whisper, you know, my call sign was Quizmaster Bailey. And if you had to pay attention because you would hear, Quizmaster Bailey, this is so and so, fire mission. You know, because they couldn't say, they couldn't talk. They would be right under the enemy's hands, you know. So I would have to talk very quietly back to them when I gave them this, you know, the information. They gave. So I, we supported we supported anybody that came into our general area. But then we would go out on we would go out on different missions, and and when the battalion went out, I would go out with the colonel. I had the colonel, the the major, the chaplain, the head doctor. Um, 
the major and colonel's radio operators, and they each had two for battalion and everything else, and myself. So we would always be together. Um, so I didn't see, I, I seen action, I didn't see a lot of action. Most of it was, we would always be surrounded, you know, we would always be surrounded by, is this right? We would always be surrounded by, um, by gun companies. Now, a gun company, a gun company is made up of um, four squads. Each squad has four people in it. Four people carrying rifles, M79 grenade launchers, laws, which is a, a disposable rocket. You know, do they still have them? Do they? Um, and so you have four fire teams in each company. If you have four companies, how many fire teams do you have? Four times four. You have that many. You would have that many. Um, you would have that many um, fire teams that you that would be directed. So the, the colonel and all us, we would always be right in the middle, and the gun companies would be sort of out and around us. So they sort of protected us, but that doesn't mean we still didn't get small arms fire coming in on us. Um, a lot of times we got hit by our own stuff. We had one instance where we were out in the field on an operation, and I was sitting up on top of an, an amphibious and track. It was a it was a vehicle that had a front that would fold down. People could get in it, fold back up. They could go in the water, go across the lake, or go across the, a river or whatever. But I was sitting up on top. Nobody was inside that particular day. We were at a point where the gun company in front of us was engaged in a firefight about 300 yards away. And they called for air support. And so the air, the, the two jet planes were approaching and they called me and said, where do you want us to drop the napalm? Does anybody know what napalm is? It's like gasoline, but it's sticky. Yeah, it's like a jello. It's like a jello that when it when it blows, it catches on fire and it sticks to you. It sticks to you. So I said, I, I called down to the fire company. I said, what do you want them to come in on? And he said, I want them to come in on the white smoke. Everybody, we always carried these canisters that had different color smoke in it. Red, green, white, um, yellow. And so they popped a white smoke and threw it where they wanted the jets to drop their napalm. Unfortunately, to my right, they were burning a hut and it was giving off white smoke. And there was a platoon of Marines around there having lunch. Well, that jet came around and I was watching him and he was coming around and he was coming around and he was coming around and I thought, he's going a little too far. And then I realized, there was a white, the, the hut was burning white, and he was coming in on that hut, and before I could yell abort on the radio, he dropped 200, he dropped two 500 pound napalm bombs. And all I could see was those two silver things tumbling, coming at, coming at us, and, and I just yelled, everybody get down. And I was leaning on the back of the, of the, um, unit I was sitting on had an angled exhaust pipe and I had the two radios on it and I was leaning back and I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up to get off so I just rolled over. Fortunately for me, I didn't get hit with anything but the whole platoon got burnt. To this, I don't know how many died, I don't know how many lived but they dropped it on us. So we had a lot of casualties. We had 57,000 men and women get killed there, over 57,000. Men and women died in Vietnam. Some of them, there's a percentage that were killed by our own fire, by our own bombs, by our own stupidity. Another time, they they teach you when you're going through. Uh, they teach you when you go to. Uh, when I went to Camp Pendleton to be a radio operator, you also go through a class of survival, how to survive, how to escape and survive. Um, part of that is they teach you what to do, what not to do. You know, where to, if you're out in the field, don't go to like a corner of a building. Don't, don't, if this is the corner of the building, 
don't come up to the corner of the building to look around because that's right where they're going to put a mine. So you never do that. You stay out a little bit. Unfortunately for me, uh, at one time I sat down right at the corner of the building and guess what was on it? On a mine. I didn't know it. Another guy came over, another radio operator came over to sit next to me. Why I did this, I don't know. There was plenty of room. I scooched over like that, and when I did, he was sitting down, and that mine went off and killed him. I didn't even get a scratch, not, not a scratch, not anything. He took the whole blast. The, the Vietnam, in Vietnam, as I said before, they all dressed in the same clothing. They all wore black silk pants and shirts. The Viet Cong were, they were right in the villages. They wore the same thing. You didn't know, you didn't know who your enemy was. You didn't know who the friendly people were. During the day, they could be in your compound. They could be the guy that's cutting your hair. They could be the people that are doing your laundry. They could be the people working in the PX. They could be the people in the mess hall doing some cleaning here and there. And at night, they're the ones outside the wire shooting at you. Now they would drop mortars in on us. At night, they used to call harassment. Just to, they would just lob them in. And then the next day, you could see one of them walking off from where the round hit to the building. Because they would go back and give them the corrections. So we used to catch them doing that a lot. So you never knew who your enemy was. They used children. They used children to um, carry bombs. You know, the children would come into the compound, they'd walk over to your tent, and the next thing you know, you'd blow up. The kids would do it. The women would do it. You'd walk through a village, get to the other side, and they'd start shooting at you from behind, and the only people that were in there were women. All the men were gone. So the women would be shooting at you. So you never knew who you were fighting. Now, if there was any NVA there, the North Vietnamese Army, they wore uniforms. They had regular uniforms. This is the first time that the United States was in a war, and it really wasn't a war. It was only called a, a, a police action. Um, it's the only time, uh, up to that point, that was the only time where you fought an, an enemy that didn't wear a uniform, other than the North Vietnamese. We also had some red Chinese in there. And the reason you knew that was because Vietnam people were my height. Very, very seldom you see anyone, uh, a Vietnamese person that was taller, you know, than me. They were all small people. But a red Chinese man was, they'd be six foot, they'd be built like, you know, crazy, and, and you knew they were not Vietnamese. And of course their features are different than Vietnamese too, so you knew that the red, the red Chinese were there helping also. Um, They used a lot of drugs. When they got ready, when they got ready at night to attack, they would smoke opium. They would get so high on opium before they charged your wire. They didn't care. They didn't care how many times you shot them. They didn't care how many hand grenades you threw at them. They would live for hours and hours and hours after afterwards. Um, one particular guy came towards our wire in the middle of the wire. The kid on the machine gun, he was shooting a 50 caliber machine gun, which is a very large bullet. And he must have hit him 15, 20 times. And that guy just kept coming until he got to the wire and then finally fell in the wire. And he lived for eight hours after that. He was still alive the next day at noontime. And then he finally passed on. They just, that's the way they did things. Um, this was the first time, this was the first time where we had to deal with uh, booby traps. You know, in World War II and, 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 and uh, World War I, they had, they had booby traps. They had landlines and stuff like that. But in Vietnam, they would use whatever they could to, to make a booby trap. They would take bamboo sticks and they would take a machete and cut it off on an angle so it came to a nice point. 
they would make take a they would take bamboo and they would stick a whole bunch of them through, weave them, tie them down, and then they would pull it, put a rope to it and pull it up into the, on a branch, pull the branch back with a rope and a trip wire. And if you trip that wire, that thing would come down and either get you in the back, get you in, you know in the front, and you would be impaled on on those on what they call them punchy sticks. They also dug holes in the ground. Some of them were just small, maybe two foot by two foot. Some of them were six feet by six feet. And in the bottom, they would put those sticks and they would be angling them all kinds of ways. And they, they would defecate on them. They would poop. And then they would stick the pointed end into that so that when it went through you, it would not only give you, it would give you, you know, you could, would get a disease. You would it, you, it, you'd get an infection if it didn't kill you. So they would do things like that. The other thing they would do is if they stole, you know, it, well, let, let me jump to this for a minute. This is some of the food we were eating in Vietnam. When I got there, these are called sea rations. I was eating sea rations that were canned in 1949, the year I was born. And this was 1967. Okay. They weren't bad. They weren't great, but they weren't bad. They had things like scrambled. Go ahead. Were there MREs back then? No. Oh, okay. No. Um, things like scrambled eggs and ham, potatoes and beef, spaghetti, beans and franks, beans and uh, meatball, meatball and something else. I can't remember what it was. Um, there was twelve in a box. Each box had a different thing. Now this 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 one here happened to be a, a, a potato and beef one, and it was a, and it was a can the size of a, a soup can. Unfortunately, it went bad, and I had to throw it out. Um, but that was your main meal, and you also got this is over here. You also got uh, some kind of fruit in there, and you got um, some kind of dessert. We usually got crackers and either a peanut butter or um, or a jelly. Mostly it was peanut butter though um, in there. And you had to carry these. If you were going out in the field for four or five days, you had to carry four or five meals like this. Um, this this happened. This happens to be the, the what they call a B2 unit. And in this can here are four crackers. There's a package of cocoa, and, and oh, oh, cocoa beverage powder. So that's just the two things that are in there. Um, so you had to bring a can opener with you? Don't get it. Oh, this is awesome. Don't get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this, this other one here is a cinnamon roll. You open it up, you got a cinnamon roll. We would empty out our B2s. We would empty out our B2 cans. We would take a knife, punch some holes in here, bend the top back. With each case of with each case of sea rats, you got these little blue tabs. They were heat tabs. We would put the heat tab in the can, light it on fire with a match. Everybody over there smoked. Everybody had a Zippo. Everybody had matches. Actually, it, they came. You got a pack of matches in your little packet because at that time they were still having, they still had cigarettes in there because everybody smoked in World War II. Everybody smoked, so they had little packs of uh, four cigarettes in a little box either, and they were all non-filtered Camels, uh, Lucky Strikes, Pall Malls, whatever, Chesterfields, Chesterfields. And <laughs> yeah. And so you would take your ring, your, you would light that, and that would be your stove. You'd take your main meal and stand it on top of there, and then you would just, you know, mix it up until you ate it. Um, and then, so you would carry four or five of these, and what we would, so you didn't have to carry them in a box. We would take extra socks, and we'd put them down in the socks, and then tie the top of the sock real tight so that it wouldn't make any noise. Because if you were out at night, you wouldn't want to be here and climbing. You could hear that 10 miles away. Um, here's the little, here's the, uh, I think this is the peanut butter. Yeah, this is the peanut butter. So you got a main meal, you got a dessert. Um, 
The two desserts that were highly prized were pound cake and peaches. If you had pound cake and peaches, you could get just about anything you want from anybody. They all wanted your pound cake and your peaches. Nobody gave it away. Everybody. Um, there was fruit cocktail, there were pears. It just depended on which meal you took. Um, so to answer the question, like I said before, everything in the military, the government has a number for everything. And I don't have mine with me, but we had this little metal piece. I can't even draw it. It's a P, oh, it's called a P-37, I believe. A P-37. Had a, a, little, a little thing, you fold the thing over, it was a point, and you would just all the way around and open your can. That's how you open it. Oh, no electric can opener? Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> just like I had an electric air dryer over there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that, that can opener had a little hole in it. Everybody put it on their dog tags because everybody had to wear dog tags. A dog tag was, and I, I forgot to bring mine, that had your name, it didn't have your rank, your name, your, your serial number, your blood type, and your religion was on that dog tag. When you got killed, they would leave one tag on you, they would take one off, take it with them, the, I'm sorry, they'd take both of them off of you. One, they would put in your boot, in your laces, before they put you in a bag. The other one went with the with your lieutenant or whoever to be turned into a uh, battalion to um, so they could register you as killed in action. Huh. Um, I wonder why there was two. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. One goes on one went on your boot and one went to battalion. So then if you end up staying alive through the war, you'd end up still having the two dog yeah. tags on. Yeah, and I still have my two. Yeah. We also go ahead, but what range were you when you retired? I didn't retire. I only put in four years, but I was a, I was an E5 when I got out. I made I, I in boot camp in boot camp at back then they would pick two two recruits to be what they called the house mouses, your house mouse. And you and the job of one of them was to be the person who did all the paperwork for the drill instructors, and the other one was just the general house mouse who ran for coffee, and that was my job to go for coffee every day. And in boot camp by the door going into the drill instructor's room where he slept because he didn't sleep with us. He had his own room. Up on the wall was a board that was painted yellow. And if you wanted to talk to the drill instructor, you had to walk up to there and you had to go. Private so-and-so, request permission to enter. That's how you had to do it. So every morning, we had somebody a fire watch all night long. Different guys would have to walk around all night long in a brick building to make sure there were no fires. At 5.30 in the morning, they would wake me up, I'd get dressed, take my shower, get dressed, and my job was to go to the mess hall and get the drill instructor his coffee. And I would come back with his coffee in my hand, and I'd get by that stupid thing, and I'd go, Private Newberger with the, with the drill instructor's coffee. Come in. And I'd go in, and he'd say, is it hot? Yes, sir. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Show me! And I'd stick my finger in it. <laughs> Is it hot? Yes, sir. Good. Now go get me another cup because you stuck your finger in my coffee. <laughs> and I have to go back. <laughs> they, just, they just like to give you a hard time. Um, but everything they do is for a reason. So that was my job every day. Every time somebody wanted coffee, I had to go to the mess hall and get coffee. So it wasn't a bad deal. So when I graduated, uh, they, they picked so many people and they give them a rank. So when you go in, you're an E1. You're an E1, which is a, uh, you guys want to listen or you want to come up here and talk to them? You can want to come up and talk if you want. I'm more than happy to listen to you. Um, I, they gave me PFC, which is private first class. You, everybody is a private. I was promoted to private first class. While I was in Vietnam for those two years, I became a Lance Corporal, then I became a Corporal, and then I became an E-5. And I was an E-5 until I got out four years later. But when I got out, they promoted me to E-6, which is a Staff Sergeant. And the reason they do that is because once you get out, you still have a two-year obligation with the government. Okay? Everybody who joins, it's a six-year obligation. 
So you're you're in inactive reserve. So if they call me back, if if, if you decide to go back, or if they call you back, you drop a rank. So they gave me E6 in case I went back, I would go back as an E5 again. Okay. So um, so yeah. So I made E6. I mean A. I mean A5, E5 in Vietnam. Uh, some of the other things we had to deal with were, and I know it's going to be hard to see, but I'll pass it around. They would dig tunnels in their villages, underneath, you know, underneath the where they have their rice stored. You could move that whole thing, and there'd be tunnel entrance. Here, take a look at that and pass it around. Down in those tunnels, they would have hospitals, they would have kitchens, they would have sleeping areas. They would booby trap them so that if you uh, and we used to send we used to send guys down there, go into those tunnels. They were called tunnel rats. Small guys like me are smaller. They would go down with a with a knife in your mouth and a and a 45 handgun because there's no way you're going to get a rifle down. Some of them holes were really small, but once you got down in there, it opened up into rooms and rooms and rooms and rooms and rooms, and rooms. And, and so you were fighting people that could hide all the time, and then all of a sudden pop up out of nowhere. They would store ammunition down there, they would store rice down there, they would put snakes, they would put snakes, they would carve a little hole in the side of the tunnel with a trip wire or, or a poisonous snake in there, you'd go crawling through in the dark, because they were dark, it was dark, all you had was a flashlight, and how many of you ever seen one of those military flashlights that have the angle on, right, a Boy Scouts using and stuff? Um, that's what we would have, a flashlight like that, again, a knife in his mouth, and a 45, and you'd be crawling through. So you really didn't see any things that were on the side. So, I mean, a lot of times it, a knife would come flying out at you, or a snake would get you. I mean, there was tons of stories that you would hear over there. So you were fighting that kind of a war. Uh, and getting back to the big can, when, you, when we ate, we, made, we had to make sure that we crushed these, and we would dig a hole and bury them. Because if you didn't, especially the bigger can, which probably was about that size, if you didn't crush them, they would take a can like this, and they would take a hand grenade. This is a hand grenade. If, if this hand grenade went off over here, most everybody in the circle would be dead, okay? Or, or definitely wounded, all right? They would take it, pull the pin, and put it in that can. And the reason for that is, if you pull this pin, which you're never supposed to do. <laughs> That's effective, right? Yeah. You want to take a chance? No. Yeah, sure. How about it? I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. So, yeah, they're spring loaded. There's, it's a, there's a spring loaded, so when you let this go, this flies off. And then there's a little plunger in there that you have about 10 seconds to get rid of this thing or it's going to go off. Um, and so they would put it, they would pull the pin, they pull the pin, leave, the, leave this on there to, to you know, hold the thing down. They would tie a piece of a trip line to it and they would stick it in the can. And then the trip line would be across the ground or up high. And, and you couldn't see them. I mean, they were, you know, thin lines. And you'd walk by and it would pull this out of that can and boom. So they would use their own stuff against us. They would do the same thing with un, um, big howitzer shells that we were talking about here, the 105s, the 15 types that didn't detonate. They would take them and tie them to a tree with a, with a detonating with uh, some kind of uh, uh, explosive on it and trip wire and you would trip that wire and that 105 round would go off and it, 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 you would just, you just become a vapor. You just, they would just, I see one guy that would, the, his whole body was gone from his head down to his, his groin. Everything in here just, it just was gone. His head, it, 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 his head actually fell to his waist and, and he was just sitting there. And, and that's, I mean, that's how some guys died. It was just, you know, it was terrible. Um, so yeah, movie traps. Um, so, if, so, Mr. Duberger, I, I, uh, I, I'm going to ask this question. I want you to know that I'm asking it with all, all due respect. I, I don't mean any disrespect. 
But as I listen to you explain what the Viet Cong did, to some degree, so say what's on your mind. Okay. Just say what's on your mind. To some degree, were they not being intelligent with what they had in terms of? I mean, they didn't have anything. They, I mean, so like it's it's not like they had a whole thing whole lot of ammunition to use it's not so well, actually they did because they were being supplied by the North Vietnamese okay everything came down the Ho Chi Minh Trail everything uh, pack mules um, they they would use women and I, and I don't I do not agree at all with the way they they carried out war but they they significantly changed the history of the way wars are fought, right? Because this was the first time yeah. you didn't clearly know who the enemy was, exactly. right? And I, and I and I would just argue to some degree, there's some brilliance there. Well, the North Vietnamese weren't they weren't stupid by no means. You know, the people in the South they were not educated, obviously, they, and and they didn't know. How to, how to fight a war. I mean, you know, although if you look at the history of Vietnam, the French were in there for how many years? Oh, right. and, they, and they finally just said, the heck with it, and they left, and that's when, you know, the United States went in. So, yeah, they were being supplied by North Vietnam, and, and, and they had advisors from North Vietnam with them. They had advisors from China with them. So, you know, they were being taught all this stuff. Yeah, that's the first time that we had to deal with terrorism. If you look at it that right. way, you know, you didn't right. know, you didn't know where the next bomb was going to be. You didn't know every day, right. every day at when our compound after we opened our gates in the morning, seven o'clock, whatever, the, mo the the engineers would have to go out with minesweepers and walk from there all the way down to the next compound, which was a good 12 or 13 miles away. And they would have to sweep that road for landmines because overnight they would come and dig holes and put in pressure mines for the, for the trucks and the jeeps that were gonna go back and forth. So every day you had to go and clear that. So yeah, you, you know, you're right, but. You know. if I, I would argue immoral, like to, uh, not that war is good, right? I, I, I don't necessarily think that war is a good thing because people dying is not a good thing. Um, but they, they, I mean, they changed, they changed the way wars are fought and they, they brought the unexpected. Yeah. This was not what you were trained right. to deal with. And so it made... It well, made the war very difficult. Yeah, we weren't trained to an extent because they did teach us about the punchy pits and, right. and you know don't stand next to the building where the bot where where a mine might be and and, and and things like that. So we did have some experience. You know, we they were. I mean, let's face it. We started in there what 1960, 62 is when they started sending advisors in. Right. And then eventually built up troops and you know 63, 64, 65. I was there during Way, Way City, when, you know, when the big... Has, any, I, I, has anybody here seen the movie uh, Full Metal Jacket? Okay, so that pretty much... You've seen Full Metal Jacket? Yeah. Um, so that pretty much is really close to boot camp, number one, and the Vietnam War, you know? That was, that was pretty, pretty darn on. Um, about about that, especially with the young lady that was a sniper. That that young lady was trained. She was a young girl, maybe not even older than you guys here, and her job was to sit in that <coughs> factory and shoot Americans, and she did a good job until they finally got her. But she shot one guy. She and she was smart. She was smart because her first shot got him in the knee. And so he went down and he laid there. And the reason she did that was to draw out other Marines to come and get him because, because Marines will do that. We're not gonna leave anybody behind. If we have to rescue somebody, we'll, we'll waste 10, don't ask me why, but we'll waste 10 guys trying to save one. That's the Marine way, you're made, you know. But her, what she did was she shot him in the knee and he laid there yelling for help. And every time somebody would start to go out, she'd shoot him in another part of his body. 
until he was finally dead. And then they rushed her and 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 um, and at the end of the movie, if you haven't seen it, um, they finally get up into the factory where she is. The one guy shoots her, but she's not dead, and she's laying there, you know. And he says, "My God, she's only a, a child," and and she's wounded pretty bad. And and she says to the guy, she says to the American Marine, "Kill me, please, kill me." And he and he shoots her, he kills her. Children, they use children. Same thing in Iraq. Same thing in Afghanistan. They use kids to carry things. They strap bombs to them. Don't have them with a hand grenade. You don't know. Never, never know. How much time do I have? I know. You have way more time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'll stay here all afternoon if you can. Okay. So, so that was pretty much Vietnam. Uh, there are a couple things I'd like to show you. I'd like to see. Can we can we put something up on TV? Uh, YouTube. Can we do YouTube? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There's there's a there's a thing there's a marine that I want you to see. Um, so while we're doing that, so let me let me go through some things here. Um, I'd like a volunteer. Stand up. So this is called this is called 782 gear. Everybody gets 782 gear. <laughs> okay. So what it consists of. Oh. Well, I want everybody back here. Okay. okay. So, can you? Oh. Okay. So, everybody look. We got canteens. Most guys carry two canteens, some guys carry a lot more. It just depends on how much water you drink. Turn around. I got you. On the back is um, on the back is a first aid kit. Not too many people carry first aid kits. Maybe one or two guys. Mostly you carry a big tie bandage on your helmet. Most everybody um, everybody had a rubber in you know, like a piece of uh, rubber around your helmet where you could stick bandages and most everybody carried that. Uh, the medic who was a Navy, uh, who was a Navy, uh, not a doctor, but he was the corpsman, he's a corpsman, he's trained to, you know, help people who've been shot and blown up and all that stuff. He carried a big bag with all the kinds of stuff in it. But in here there's stuff like um, band-aids and, and water purification tablets. If you took any water out of a stream, you had to put iodine tablets in it to kill any bacteria. Um, and it tasted like iodine. So we would always write home and have mom or dad or whoever send us packets of Kool-Aid so that you could put it in your water. Anything to anything to flavor the water so you didn't taste the iodine. Um, now these here are these these magazine these pouches right here, there's three of them. On each side there's a round turn back around this way. On on each side of it is a little round pouch for a hand for hand grenades. So on each pouch you can carry two. So on this particular setup you could have six hand grenades. Each one of these pouches will carry three magazines for your M16. Okay? So three times three, right? Each one probably weighs, I don't know, four or five ounces, maybe more loaded. So you got all that weight on there. When you're, when you're out in the field. This is a 50 caliber shell. That's a 50 caliber shell. Now the whole thing doesn't come out of the gun, only that end. So imagine getting hit 15 times with that. At 2,500 yards, the, 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 the snipers in Vietnam had a 50 caliber set up on top of the bunkers, and they had a scope on it, and they had it set for 2,500 yards. They could shoot somebody 2,500 yards away. It's a half a mile. Yeah. And the power, the power of this bullet, this one bullet, if you were standing there and you had your hand out, 
and it hit your hand, it would rip your whole arm right off your body. It would, the power behind that shell would rip, it would just rip your arm right off your body. If it hit you in the chest, it would actually flip you over. It would actually flip you over and not get back, or, or not get back. Cut you in half. Yeah. Wait, how is that God survive? Because he was so high on drugs, he just... Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, so get back, so get back to the drum city brain went to the body. So, 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 this is a flak jacket. <laughs> this, this will, if you get shot, it's supposed to make the bullet deter, you know, but not hit you. Uh, this will just will keep uh, uh, shrapnel from hitting you, okay? But it didn't help. So it didn't help. Most of, nobody, nobody usually, we never zipped them. It's just too darn hot. We didn't zip them. So if the bullet came in straight, it was going to get you. If your arm was up and it came under here, it would get you. So you still were vulnerable, but this did a lot of good, okay? So out in the field, you had that stuff and that stuff. Everybody had to wear a helmet. <laughs> okay, so now you, so now you, so you got some weight on there, right? Yeah, a lot. So right, so now you're. This is what you're out. You're carrying. Um, a lot of us. I have a knife pouch here. I can't bring it into school, obviously, but I have a knife so you pouch taped to my my a strap. So I had a knife there. Um, and so now, besides that. You have to carry this. Okay, so now so now you got all your power finale as they say. What are you missing? You're missing your rifle? Or some some radio operators just carry a 45 by carrying a rifle. What else are you missing? Where's your food? Food? Extra socks? Whatever silly personal stuff you might want. So on on now you have to realize I carry two radios. So if you could turn around, I got you just turn No. <laughs> okay. It's not the way I did it. I didn't have these special things in Vietnam, so I had to jury rig it. So I had two radios on here, and then on that, who's got who's got the belt? There's a there's a pack. I'd have to write my you to Who had the pack? Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so this is called an Alice pack. <laughs> Now this, okay. Okay, I would strap this on top of my bag back there, on my backboard, and in here, of course, I would have extra socks, because in Vietnam you had to carry extra socks and foot powder every night when we stopped to dig in for the night. Who's got the shovel? Every night, but not everybody, not everybody carried a shovel because we all shared them. Somebody would carry a shovel. You would use this to, you would use this to get a hole started, and then you would turn it over and fold it out, and and dig, everybody would dig a foxhole for one or two guys, and. That's what you would sleep in it. So you would have somebody would have this. You don't need it. You would also have one of these and one of these. Carry all of that. No. Carry all of this. So this here, this is a, this is called a poncho liner. Also called a whoopie. Yeah. This is your poncho in case it rains. In case it rains, you are in the rainforest, so it rained, right? Yeah, my monsoons. Okay, so that, that's what you want to She's good. Yeah, probably, 
By the time you're all said and done, 60, 70, 80 pounds. Okay? And, and you're going up and down now. Now, this is a poncho. This is a poncho. This is designed to go in the poncho. It's got these little strings on it, which, wow. would, which you would put through the holes, and you would fold it over as a, and use it as a sleeping bag. Okay, the other thing this was used for, unfortunately, was for carrying the dead. You could use it as a stretcher, lay them on there, brush them out, you know, they would bring helicopters in, just pick them up, throw them on there, you know, carry them on your, on your, uh, your, um, Poncho. I put pull on your poncho, and uh, so it was used for that also. Like all of it? No, just uh, Okay, so there wasn't much more other than your food, extra ammunition. Everybody had something extra to carry. If you were in a gun, but if you were on one of the, uh, if you were with one of the um, uh, companies, you know, with the four fire teams, in that fire team would be a, a, an automatic, uh, would be a machine gun uh, squad. Where, who's, where's that uh, roll? Yeah. So it would be carrying an M60 machine gun, which shoots these rounds. So you had to carry enough of these. So everybody would maybe have two or three bandoliers around them, or more. And then they would sign other people to carry them. Um, there was also there was also a um, mortar. There was also a mortar uh, fire team, and they carried two. And it was an eight. Uh, carry, we didn't carry. We carried one eighty one with us, but they had sixties. It was a little bit smaller. But somebody had to carry the two. Somebody had to carry the base plate. And, and the shells, right? Everybody gets around. And everybody gets around. But the, the 60s have the, the legs on them already. They have to carry them separate. You could probably have to carry them separate. Yeah. So somebody had to carry the legs for the mortar rounds, for the, for the tubes. Hey, is everybody listening or am I just talking? Come on, guys. Give me a break. Um, you might learn something. That was walking on solid ground, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was not that was not walking through the rice paddies. That was not climbing up a mountain. That was not going through swamps. That was just walking on regular land. But would you have to? So I, I was actually tr being a little bit facetious and saying, okay, so easy walking on a road. Yeah. With all of that, I, I shouldn't say easier walking on a road but if you're actually in the jungle where you don't have a path to walk through right. and jungles are wet with puddles here and there big wet spots yeah um, so 60 70 80 pounds you said yeah walking uneven ground trees probably vines get caught on things yeah. uh, well you had somebody you always had points you always had people walking the point and the, and the guy walking the point, his job was to look for trip wires, look for people oh. up ahead, hiding in the bushes. His job was to cut down anything that needed to be cut down. And and so you always had a point. So you did, you know, listen, the, the, the colonel and the jam, the, the, the colonel and the major are gonna go like this. They want a clear path. So they had somebody out in front of them, but the rest of them didn't. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So, um, so the only uh, the only other thing, um, and not everybody, we really didn't carry these um, out in the field. These were more for back on the base because on the perimeter of our base, we had bob wire all around Constantina, the rolls of razor wire, um, triple and triple high, and we had landmines and we had uh, um, we had uh, claymore mines and we had gas grenades and. So you had to have a gas mask. Everybody had a gas mask. Um, one night we had one night we had a canister go off outside our tent. Everybody had to get it, put it on. It was a tiger. Came through came through the wire and tripped the gas. Tigers? A tiger. We had a tiger. We had bears. We had if you were out in the field walking on the on the on the rice paddy dikes, you had to look out for. Um, uh, 
Pythons. Yeah. Pythons. Some of them were huge, you know. Pigs. Pigs would be running all over the place, especially if you were, especially if you were close to a, a village. There'd be pigs running all over. There'd be chickens running all over. You never knew what was going to trip. What about? So I, I, I had the pleasure of getting to know a, um, a gentleman that used. To, if I said Dean Raymond, would you know Dean Raymond? No. So he used to drive the BFA bus. He was the PE bus driver. And so he drove the kids back and forth to the complex. He was in the Vietnam War, except that he was in civilian clothing because, because his job actually was to sort of, my guess is to gather intelligence and reconnaissance about what was really kind of going on. And he mentioned to me the monkeys. Yeah, we had monkeys. He said... We had monkeys climbing all over us. Yeah. yeah. He said, Especially if you were up on the mountains. You know, they'd come down, they'd steal your food. <laughs> They'd steal your hat and steal whatever they, you know, take whatever they could take. You know, they didn't bother you. They just, you know, they'd be jumping around and, you know, take this and take that. Grab your, grab your canteen if it was sitting there and take it up in the tree, you know. And yeah, it was crazy. But yeah, yeah, we had, we had that. Yeah. So, so, so this is a gas mask. Afghanistan, they're in a climate where it is hot. It is hot. And they have suits. We didn't have suits back then for chemical warfare, but they do now, right? They have a suit that they have to put on. And sometimes you only have seconds to get this gear on. So this is a gas mask. So what do you do? Put your chin in here first and then pull it over your head. Now you stand still. <laughs> now breathe. Breathe. Oh, I took I took the filters out. Okay. So you can breathe. So on each side here would be a filter, and to check to make sure your mask isn't leaking, you would put your hands over it and try to breathe. If air was coming in, you didn't have it on tight enough. If no air came in, you were good. So now now you're in the jungle. Now not now you're not in the jungle. Now you're <laughs> so now you're now you're in the desert. Now you're in the desert. Now you got to fight. Now you got now you're in a firefight. Firefight's over. Gas all over the place. You need to drink water. What are you gonna do? You gonna take your mask off? No. You're gonna get your canteen now. You get your straw. Get to get your canteen out. Now, how are you going to drink the water from here to there? On the top of this, the government came up with this idea. You pop this little cap off. You pull this out from here. You put it in there. Wait, wait, wait. Now, right here. No, right here. No, 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 no. Right here. Feel that? Flip it up. Feel the thing come up into your mouth? No. There should be a little straw that comes up. Oh, right. Yeah. So there's a little thing that comes up, and you hold it up, and you can suck water through it, so you don't have to take your mask off. Huh? Okay. Yeah, you just breathe. Let me let me listen. Oh, really had to do that. I had to. I absolutely had to. Okay, so so um, does anybody have any questions before I show this thing? Can we bring up that video of David Letterman? 
Perception is obviously very strange at that moment. It was. I was confused because the last thing I remembered, I was on top of a roof, and I, I didn't know if I was had been patrolling and stepped on ID, and that's just the last thing I could remember. Um, after uh, when I got hit, my vision was almost like if a TV didn't have cable, it was just white and gray static. Uh, my ears were ringing very loud. I, I couldn't hear anything because my ruptured eardrums. Uh, the next thing I felt was uh, warm water. I uh, felt like warm water was being poured all over me from the blood loss. Uh, You're 22 years old. Was that? 21. 21 years. Yes, sir. Uh, and the, the, the reason uh, you suffered these massive injuries is because what did you do? You, you put yourself between your, your buddy and the grenade? You fell on the grenade? What was the actual action on your part? From eyewitness accounts and forensic evidence and a post-blast analysis, 
uh, I uh, show it and cover it uh, in the day uh, for my delivery. This is fascinating because this is nearly a textbook a case of uh, combat. Is this because of Kyle Carpenter, or is this because of Kyle Carpenter the version? Well, you know, the second we step on the old footprints at boot camp, it's a still to us that there's a bigger purpose that the uniform we wear has uh, a rich history legacy. Uh, Marines that have uh, been heroic before us to take care of our junior Marines. And that when we get uh, in those bad parts of the world that nobody wants to go to, the race of our right and left uh, is all we have. Uh, so I would like to say it was me. Uh, I would like to think it was a little bit me, but uh, absolutely the Marine Corps and our history uh, and just everything we stand for uh, makes us want to, to be uh, courageous and do this. Well, God bless you. We had uh, spent uh, four months at the patrol base uh, that entire time in the same spot. And we had got a mission to push south, and there was no Marines, uh, and it was a strong, uh, I guess, an enemy strong. Uh, we got a mission to push down. Uh, we knew it was going to be a bad fight. Uh, we knew we were going to take casualties, but it was necessary to uh, push that Marine presence out further. Well, please welcome Corporal Kyle Carpenter. <laughs> class in school there when you received the call, who calls you to announce that you are the new recipient? Well, uh, about a week ahead of time, I got the exact day and time that the president would call me. So I got out of class, I drove home about 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, my parents checked my brothers out of school. So while, uh, while we're looking for the other one that I want you to show, show you, I want you to think about what he did here. So. Where did my hand underneath go? Marines always lose these things. <laughs> so this is this is what he did. This is what he rolled on. This is what he grabbed and pulled into himself here, and it blew. It exploded. Now I couldn't find the one I was looking for because David Letterman. If you Google it, Google David Letterman interviews Kyle Carpenter. There is a segment where he goes through all the injuries that he got. His face, his whole face has been reconstructed. He had broken bones. David Letterman says to him, you've had 30, he said, you had 30 broken bones. And, and Kyle Carpenter said, yes, just in this arm alone. 30 bones were broken, 30 places. He says, I'm an overachiever. <laughs> his whole uh, how he stayed alive I don't know uh, God kept him alive that's all I could think because this thing is going to kill you and he rolled on it that's commitment that's commitment that's what he's talking about when you when you step on the yellow footprints when you get to boot camp when you get to ba uh, basic training in the Marine Corps that bus pulls up to, to the to the induction induction center there and outside that bus, there are all yellow footprints on the ground. And that drill instructor gets on the bus and he starts screaming at you, get off the bus and get on them yellow footprints. And that's what everybody does. And that's where it begins. And that's where you're taught that it's not just you. You're in a firefight. The only people you have to depend on is the person on your right, the guy on your right, and the guy on your left. 
Those are the only two people that are going to help you if you get shot or if one of them gets shot. So you have to depend on each other. And that's a commitment. When you, when you join the military, and I don't care which branch you join, you stand up and you take an oath to sol I solemnly swear that I will protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America from all her enemies, friendly and foe. That's, that's a commitment. That's a commitment. You're giving the government two years of your life, four years of your life, six years of your life. Some people stay in for a lifetime. You're making a commitment. Commitment is a lot. You make a commitment, you better do it. My daughter, who is a high school <coughs> um, in Petersburg, joined soccer team. She wanted to quit. Nope. You made a commitment. You're there till the end. Sorry. I don't want to hear it. You made a commitment. <coughs> well, why can't I quit? Because those other 13 people are depending on you to do your job. Depending on you to do your job. I mean, I don't ask much of her, you know. All I ask is, you know, do well. I don't care if you don't get all A's, but do well. Commit yourself to learning and, and doing what you need to do. Same thing with all you folks here. Make a commitment to do the best you can. You don't have to be A students. You don't have to be B students. <coughs> Hell, I, I was a barely made D student. I, I'm happy with D's. But if you're giving 100% to what you're doing, Nobody can put you down for that. You know, that you made that commitment. Yeah, I am going to do what I have to do to graduate. I'm going to do what I have to do in life to help out. My daughter always says to me, Dad, why are you the first one to raise your hand and say, I'll do that? Because nobody else will. Nobody else will. Sit around. Sit around. And, one of the teachers says, okay, who's going to do this? How many people raised their hand? Stand up. Don't be afraid to stand up. If you're wrong, what's going to happen? They're going to say, hey, you're wrong. Do it this way. That's how you learn. But commitment, commitment is everything, especially in the military. Um, I, I'm not, I don't want to play this whole thing, but I would like you to just watch maybe the first five minutes of this. This is... Um, a SEAL commander who is giving a commencement speech um, at his alma mater. So there's a few things I want you to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, President Powers, Provost uh, Fenves, deans, members of the faculty, family and friends, and most importantly, the class of 2014. It is... It is indeed an honor for me to be here tonight. It's been almost 37 years to the day that I graduated from UT. I remember a lot of things about that day. I remember I had a throbbing headache from a party the night before. I remember I had a serious girlfriend, who I later married. That's important to remember, by the way. And I remember I was getting commissioned in the Navy that day. But of all the things I remember, I don't have a clue who the commencement speaker was, and I certainly don't remember anything they said. So acknowledging that fact, if I can't make this commencement speech memorable, I will at least try to make it short. So the university slogan is, what starts here changes the world. Well, I've got to admit, I kind of like it. What starts here changes the world. Tonight there are almost eight thousand students, well, there are more than 8,000 students, graduated from UT. So that great paragon of analytical rigor, ask.com, says that the average American will meet 10,000 people in their lifetime. 10,000 people, that's a lot of folks. But if every one of you changed the lives of just 10 people, and each one of those people changed the lives of another 10 people, and another 10, then in five generations, 125 years, the class of 2014 will have changed the lives of 800 million people. 800 million people. Think about it. Over twice the population of the United States. Go one more generation, and you can change the entire population of the world. 8 billion people. 
If you think it's hard to change the lives of 10 people, change their lives forever, you're wrong. I saw it happen every day in Iraq and Afghanistan. A young army officer makes a decision to go left instead of right down a road in Baghdad, and the 10 soldiers with him are saved from a close-in ambush. In Kandahar province, Afghanistan, a non-commissioned officer from the female engagement team senses that something isn't right and directs the infantry platoon away from a 500-pound IED, saving the lives of a dozen soldiers. But if you think about it, not only were those soldiers saved by the decisions of one person, but their children were saved, and their children's children. Generations were saved by one decision, one person. But changing the world can happen anywhere, and anyone can do it. So what starts here can indeed change the world. But the question is, what will the world look like after you change it? Well, I'm confident that it will look much, much better. But if you'll humor this old sailor for just a moment, I have a few suggestions that may help you on your way to a better world. And while these lessons were learned during my time in the military, I can assure you that it matters not whether you ever served a day in uniform. It matters not your gender, your ethnic or religious background, your orientation, or your social status. Our struggles in this world are similar, and the lessons to overcome those struggles and to move forward, changing ourselves and changing the world around us will apply equally to all. I've been a Navy SEAL for 36 years, but it all began when I left UT for basic SEAL training in Coronado, California. Basic SEAL training is six months of long, torturous runs in the soft sand, midnight swims in the cold water off San Diego, obstacle courses, unending calisthenics, days without sleep, and always being cold, wet, and miserable. It is six months of being constantly harassed by professionally trained warriors who seek to find the weak of mind and body and, el and eliminate them from ever becoming a Navy SEAL. But the training also seeks to find those students who can lead in an environment of constant stress, chaos, failure, and hardships. To me, basic SEAL training was a lifetime of challenges crammed into six months. So here are the 10 lessons I learned from basic SEAL training that hopefully will be of value to you as you move forward in life. Every morning in SEAL training, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up in my barracks room and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning we were required to make our bed to perfection. That seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough, battle-hardened seals, but the wisdom of this civil act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made. <coughs> that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. During SEAL training, the students, during training, the students are all broken down into boat crews. Each crew is seven students, three on each side of a small rubber boat, and one coxswain to help guide the dinghy. Every day your boat crew forms up on the beach and is instructed to get through the surf zone and paddle several miles down the coast. In the winter, the surf off San Diego can get to be eight to 10 feet high, and it is exceedingly difficult to paddle through the plunging surf unless everyone digs in. Every paddle must be synchronized to the stroke count of the coxswain. Everyone must exert equal effort, or the boat will turn against the wave and be unceremoniously dumped back on the beach. For the boat to make it to its destination, everyone must paddle. Sure. You can't change the world alone. You will need some help. And to truly get from your starting point to your destination takes friends 
colleagues, the goodwill of strangers, and a strong coxswain to guide you. If you want to change the world, find someone to help you paddle. Over a few weeks of difficult training, my SEAL class, which started with 150 men, was down to just 42. There were now six boat crews of seven men each. I was in the boat with the tall guys, but the best boat crew we had was made up of the little guys, the Munchkin crew, we call them. No one was over five foot five. The Munchkin boat crew had one American Indian, one African American, one Polish American, one Greek American, one Italian American, and two tough kids from the Midwest. They out paddled, out ran, and out swam all the other boat crews. The big men in the other boat crews would always make good natured fun of the tiny little flippers the munchkins put on their tiny little feet prior to every swim. But somehow these little guys from every corner of the nation and the world always had the last lap, swimming faster than everyone and reaching the shore long before the rest of us. SEAL training was a great equalizer. Nothing mattered but your will to succeed, not your color, not your ethnic background, not your education, not your social status. If you want to change the world, measure a person by the size of their heart, not by the size of their flippers. So I just want to, this goes on for another 15 minutes. He's got seven more things that he talks about. If, you, if you're interested, Google it. Um, you know, it's, uh, Navy SEAL commander gives commencement speech. If you look that up, this is what you'll get. He's, it's really interesting, and to me, it's really motivating when he says that if you change the lives of ten people, and they change more, and they change more, and they change more. You can, you know, you guys in this class can change the world. I mean, there's there's no reason why anyone in this class can't be what they want to be if you commit to it. If you commit to it, and if you have trouble, you ask for help. That's what you do. You don't keep your mouth shut. You stand up and say, I need help. Someone's always around to give it to you. So, you know, that's what life's all about. It's all about helping each other. Like the story I said uh, the last time here, who's packing your parachute? Whose parachute are you packing? Who are the people that are looking up to you? Who are the people that you look up to? Your teachers? Your mom, your dad, your grandparents, your older brother and sister. And the younger ones that look up to you, or your friends, or your cousins. Or it might even be your parents that look up to you to do things. You know, so everybody's life touches everybody else's. It's just life, that's just the way it is. You gotta make the best of it. Um, any questions? I yes. Marshall wants your explanation of Semper Fi. Semper, the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps is the only branch of service that makes you take history on the Marine Corps. You have to learn the history of the Marine Corps. Semper Fidelis means always faithful. That's what Semper Fi means. Once a Marine, always a Marine. I can still buy my Marine. Uh, when you watch Kyle Carpenter there, you see that uniform he was wearing? That's the uniform that made me join. That was a dress blue uniform. They are beautiful. Other, other services have nice uniforms, but they just don't top the Marine Corps. I, I don't care. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You ask the women. <laughs> always, but it means always. I should, have worn, I should have worn my dress blue today. But I didn't put the always other dress. faithful, though. Is what always means. faithful. That's 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 it. We'll never. I, I know the rest of the branches of the service say the same thing. We'll never leave a man on the battlefield, and we don't. We'll do whatever we have to do to get him back. Um, questions? Go ahead. But are the boats you brought live boats? No, 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 no. Um, yeah, they, they made me learn. You know, eagle, globe, and anchor on the collar of the of the Marines and on their hats is an eagle, globe, and anchor. I got it on my ring. That's because the Marines fight on the land, on the air, and on the sea. We're a department of the Navy. I like to say we're the men's department. Nobody got that. Anyway, uh, so yeah, the Marines are trained. That's your job. And, and the Coast Guard is, is Semper 
geez, I can't remember now, but their motto is always strong or something like that. Theirs is close to ours. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's what that means. Anybody else? Question? Before I say goodbye? Nothing. One other thing. I just wanted to tell you that, you know, in your C rations, real quickly, like I said, you used to get cigarettes. You got a little packet that came with it. These are the heat tabs. I'm not going to open it, but these are the heat tabs that you use to cook. You got a packet of sugar. You got a packet of salt. You got chiclets. Everybody know what chiclets are? Yeah, well, yeah right. Chiclets are uh, what, what's what's a gum. Yeah, they're little square pieces of gum. Yeah, like gumballs, but they're little. Yeah. Um, you get um, a creamer. You get a pack of the instant coffee. And you get this. Anybody guess what it is? Yes. Toilet paper. <laughs> Eat, you got to go. Nobody, <laughs> ca nobody carries rolls of toilet paper. You think if somebody, somebody would have to take the shovel, go out behind the tree, dig a hole, and you'd squat over the hole and do your business, and then when we were done, you'd put the dirt back on it and go away. Okay? Um, out in the soil. Yep, yep. When we were on base, when we were on base, we had these little huts, like, and, and each hut has had a board across with four holes in it. And so that was your toilet. Four guys could go at one time. Underneath were 55-gallon drums cut in half and filled up with maybe five or six gallons of diesel fuel. And every day, every morning, somebody, a couple guys were assigned to go over and take those barrels out take a roll of toilet paper, set it on fire, and put it in the diesel. Because that's the only way you could get diesel to burn. And you would burn... Your business. Your business. <laughs> you would burn it, you would burn it until it was nothing but ash, and then you would dump it on the, where the hole was dug, and then you put more diesel fuel in and put you back under there, and you were ready for the next day. So, that's right. I'm sorry. Who to hold the grenade? Who wants to hold the grenade? <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? You're all the way down. Anybody? I'm out. <laughs> You know, you're, you're so young. I was I was 17. I, was, I, I just I just turned 18. You don't know what to expect. You know, you, you land in the country. You, you go to your battalion headquarters. They issue you all your gear and uh, put you on a truck and send you out to where you're going. I mean, you know, you don't know. The, the, the most a lot of guys they say you're going to get killed either within the first month or in the last month because in the first month you have no clue what you're doing you haven't learned the last month you're too damn careful and you get yourself killed the life expectancy of a second lieutenant brand new second lieutenant the life expectancy getting off a chopper in a in a in a, in a zone in a firefight zone is 17 seconds he was dead within 17 seconds because he, 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 they didn't have enough sense not to get down. They're going to stand up and start shouting orders. Well, that's not too smart, you know. And plus, they have they would have their little things on their their lieutenant uh, bars on their shirt. Nobody wore anything, you know. You just didn't wear it because that's the things they were looking for, and they could see you, you know, a ways away. The other thing is this this an, this antenna is about 10 foot. And you put it on your back, it was like a beacon. They were looking for that. Boy, they seen this going, they would shoot right at the base of it. And guess what was at the base of it? You. Me. So you didn't use this. You used the little one over there that he's, that's on that radio. That's, that's called the little whip antenna. And you would, when you had your flak jacket on, you would bend this over. Just bend it over and put it in your collar, you know, so it wasn't, and then when you needed to talk, you would just take it out and talk and then put it back in so they couldn't see it. The, the, the two people, the two people that they wanted to kill 
was the officer in charge and the radio man. If you kill the officer and you kill the radio man, everybody else is screwed. They'll, nobody knows what to do. I mean, you know, somebody would take over, but um, in the meantime, you've just wiped out, you know, means of, tra of transmission, and your radio, and, and the man, so. Good luck. Yeah, I think you're alive. Anybody else? Okay. Mr. Mueller, I want to thank you for coming in today. It was, uh, again, the second, second, third time we're now in the USA. I really appreciate it. These guys have been awesome. Uh, considering yes. they've stopped for this long. Yeah. So now this group is which group? Team USA, 783. Okay. Now the other group is what? Renaissance. And when can I have them? Yeah, so you can we, have them. Yeah, yeah, we'll have them. Yeah, we'll when, can, when can I have them? Yeah. We will. Next one, one of us will walk you over there. We yeah. can uh, have have you meet with um, with the. We don't lead that team, so we. Yeah. Oh, 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 we, oh, we would have to get oh, them to okay. work that out. But I'm sure that they would welcome you as well. Okay. Yeah, I'll pack my stuff up, and uh, if if I can do if I can do it next week, I'll just meet this week. Okay. So we'll check. Yeah, we got space. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Newberger.